Sploosh. Oh, hello. I didn't see you there. Even though I'm here all alone and I actually have to turn on the camera, get into position and later on edit this video. I'm Ari Therger and today I'm going to briefly touch on the subject of Nordic shamanism revivalism. Now, I'll save you from wasting your time if you have come to this video thinking that I'm going to teach you how to shaman or presenting techniques to induce a trance state or any mind-altering state and perhaps even a drum session, that's not what this video is all about. If you take an online course for that, a paid workshop, buy an awful amount of books telling you how to do shamanism, you will get the exact same results as watching this video. At least this video is for free. I really do not believe people can teach you how to become a shaman and uh, do some shamanism at lunch break. That's not how things work. The romanticism of core shamanism has brought many useful perspectives and it has woken up a new interest in seeking out animistic worldviews and the traditional behaviors as responses towards the immersion of an individual into an animistic perception of life. And the experiences of such an engagement with the persons of the world. But <laughs> at the same time, and unfortunately, it has created a series of attitudes and misconceptions that prevent people from expressing and experiencing an animistic viewpoint and cosmology. Because Indeed, there's no shamanism without animism, and to understand shamanism, we should really first start by understanding an animistic perspective of life. But that's not what I'm going to talk about uh, in today's video. Uh, I have other videos touching on the matter of animism. Today, I'm going to talk about the revival of Nordic shamanism, mostly on the perspective of... Of, of the study of the anthropology of contemporary religious manifestations and belief systems. And I do hope it may come to prove useful, especially when dealing with certain sources, both historical but also sources dealing with shamanism from the New Age perspective that often doesn't portray the historical past. And indeed, more often than not, the aim isn't to draw an accurate portrayal of the historical and archaeological studies of past civilizations, cultures, peoples and religions. Um, as I said many times before on other videos, I'll be using the term shaman and shamanism just for the sake of a better understanding in order to deliver the message quickly and without a lot of side notes uh, this time. Uh, I also take the opportunity to tell you that I'll be reducing the number of videos that come out each month, uh, probably starting next month, April of 2022. And uh, many of you already know that it's getting hard to keep up the pace with YouTube while at the same time having three different jobs and a little free time on my hands. I'll probably reduce to two or three videos a month. Uh, we'll see. Uh, just a reminder. Now. With no more delay, let's start our today's video, my dear friends. Please. We have witnessed the revival of pre-Christian religions and belief systems, neo-pagan movements, new age alternative spiritualities, an increasing interest in the study of mythologies and, of course, as the study of indigenous cultures increases in search for both a cultural self-identification as well as a collective um, identification to have a sense of belonging and the hunger for new possibilities to quench our thirst for a spiritual meaning that can no longer be delivered by the obsolete religious mentality of the westernized world. We have also seen an increasing interest in shamanism as a performance and um, and service towards the community, usually related to the creation of symbiotic relationships with, let's call them for now, invisible others, in order to help the community of the living. This revivalism is also noticed when it comes to Northern Europe, of course. <laughs> Perhaps the first problem we face when trying to reconstruct and ultimately revive a certain spirituality or a perspective of a spirituality from a past culture is precisely dealing with the material at our disposal. 
mainly materials that can demonstrate concrete evidences for the existence of that spirituality and how it worked. Historical records and archaeological evidences, mostly. Perhaps it becomes a problem when the first step we take is trying to reconstruct the spirituality to fit into a particular trend. In the case of Northern Europe, most people focus on the Viking Age. So the efforts to construct a Nordic spirituality end up being a focus on a late pre-Christian period, already very much influenced by Christianity and other religions of the period, and a period of little less than 300 years of duration. Uh, these 300 years are a tiny fraction within the historical frame of the human activity in Northern Europe, which is a period of almost 12,000 years uh, since the human occupation of Scandinavia. Not to mention that a sole focus on the Viking Age and on Old Norse people, it's also completely discarding several different peoples and cultures and influences, as well as forgetting about neighboring ethnic groups that have greatly contributed to the creation of a rich history, which, like any other place on Earth, is the product of cultural, religious, and ethnic syncretism. But it is understandable why most people focus on the Viking Age when it comes to seek out a pre-Christian religious past for Northern Europe. It's mostly because the Viking Age has been a period of great fascination due to the common misconceptions, fantasy, and alternative histories that have served as the basis of political arguments since the mid-19th century, to forcibly find evidences that could support an idea of identity of a, na of a nation during the rise of political movements of a nationalist character of that period until practically the mid-20th century. Even those who have no particular political inclinations will eventually be cocked on the web of uh, political fantasies and assume them to be reliable evidences, leading them to conduct a particular reconstruction of a pagan culture that isn't actually real, which then conducts people into a world of misinformation that just creates a lot of confusion and turmoil. But it's not just this fascination with Vikings uh, for political reasons, obviously, but also the amount of materials that have survived uh, from the, that period that, that still offer a certain glimpse into the pagan mentality of Northern Europe. The Viking Age isn't just a period of rich archaeological evidences, although personally uh, the previous period, um, the Vandal period, mostly for Sweden, uh, I find it to be a, a lot richer in terms of material culture and it doesn't get as, as nearly enough attention as the Viking Age. But it isn't just the archaeological evidences, uh, but also the amount of literature that has been preserved or has survived. Even though this literature was composed by Christian clerical workers, uh, as it happens in many contexts throughout Europe, uh, it is still a wonderful body of evidences that offer a certain impression into the Nordic pre-Christian past. And this is indeed quite useful. And so... Most of the constructions and the reconstructions of a Nordic pagan past are drawn from these literary evidences. When there's the lack of evidences from literature and archaeology, uh, material culture, archaeological material culture, uh, we draw comparisons from the study of other cultures and other periods, obviously. Uh, the comparative study of mythologies as well, certain artifacts that point to similarities in pattern, but we can only draw conclusions or, at the very least, an hypothesis if we can support it with a body of evidences and scientific facts, which takes an awful lot of time and is usually subject to revisions and changes as new materials and evidences are discovered. And so new hypotheses surface that come to completely destroy what we thought we knew, uh, considering particular aspects of a culture and an historical past. So, what has often happened is that most people have drawn conclusions based on personal wishes of what they want to be the truth. In this case, we are here speaking of shamanism, and when there's the lack of evidences for shamanism, especially from the Iron Age onwards, in the case of Northern Europe, lack of evidences both in literature and material culture to try to create a 
Nordic shamanism movement, uh, people have sought evidences on New Age works concerning shamanism, from the westernized point of view, often discarding several evidences in favor of delivering a personal belief of what shamanism should be, as evidenced by the works of Mercia Eliad, as an example, which we shall talk about further ahead. Uh, who has expressed um, what shamanism is according to his own ideas of what he wanted shamanism to be and has been one of the greatest influences of the Western world to understand shamanism. And so from such works, it is built a perspective of shamanism like a unification of shamanism into a religion, which by the way, it wasn't and isn't a religion. And so these ideas are brought as evidences into other cultural realities of other historical pasts to fill in the gaps, creating types of shamanism that are not historically accurate and are thus wrongly portrayed as types of shamanism of a culture that never actually existed. Mind you that I'm not saying that Northern Europe never had shamanism, because it had and it has. What I'm saying is that more often than not, the general public is presented with a Nordic shamanism that actually never existed in the way it is being presented now. And so we move further away from the actual types of shamanism and uh, animistic mentalities that once existed. And we construct a completely new and different scenario. And I'm not also saying that it is wrong to do this, because religion, culture, traditions, and other social and magical religious factors have always been changing and evolving, and there's always been a strong syncretism of ideas and behaviors that forms the basis of culture. The only problem here is portraying a new movement as if it were historically accurate, which feeds misconceptions and historical errors which further leads the public into immersing themselves into behaviors that lack consistency and often leading people into dead ends, which then results into a disconnection. Again, when people are trying to find a connection to something, it's always very frustrating when they are face to face with inconsistencies and a lack of body of evidences that can explain why they are doing this and that, and for which purpose and what is the actual meaning. This creates an inner disagreement and also divergence with others, precisely because it, it turns into a mixture of new ideas, barely thought through, leading to a clash of ideas and disharmony. And people end up returning to the same situations and feelings they had before, which is confusion, alienation, self-doubt and insecurity. So it is important to analyze the actual evidences and it is important that the public knows the evolutions of cultures and the syncretism of ideas and behaviors and what constitutes a new age construction and what constitutes an actual historical reconstruction. And from there, with that amount of information that helps them distinguish things and helps them to know the meanings and purposes of these things, they can choose how to conduct things in the way that seems to them to be more suitable to their needs and what they want to create that better fits into their own individuality and what best works for them. In this case of shamanism, new ways to express ourselves in this field will not stop obviously, and, and, and people will continue to create and, 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 and recreate methods, not only based on vague ideas or even based on concrete ideas in terms of archaeology, anthropology, folklore and mythology, but also drawing new behaviors from their imagination and experiences, therefore developing new expressions and new ways of practicing their religions. And just because in some points they are not historically accurate, that doesn't make such expressions invalid or wrong. That's a good thing, actually, I think. Uh, to have this freedom of creating our own expressions towards the way that feels that we are accomplishing something and we feel connected. We feel like we are creating a symbiotic existence with our surroundings. But for that to happen, I think we, we have the right to know what we are doing, the reasons, the meanings, the purposes, 
so we can then be successful in the way we want to express ourselves and invent and reinvent practical behaviors. That knowledge is precious because if we start off without that knowledge, there's a greater chance that we will meet nothing but frustration and uncertainty and a sense of stagnation when what we want so fervently is to grow spiritually. So I think it's important to be aware of the historical accuracy of what we want to engage with to avoid future uncertainty, frustration and dissonance. Knowing how to distinguish the old and the new, we can then better create our own approach and express ourselves in a meaningful way to ourselves and not aimlessly picking up scattered pieces and being left with a picture that not only lacks important pieces so we can be aware of its content, but also pieces that will never fit no matter how hard we, we try to include them because they simply don't make sense because there's a lack of connection to create a meaning and an expression. I mean, we all do mistakes. We all pass through beginner's mistakes. We all pass through mistakes all our lives, even if we are experts on something. No one is exempt from committing mistakes, right? But we can mitigate the amount of mistakes and they are harsh effects that often cause a great deal of uncertainty and damage on our self-esteem. If we start from a point supported by reliable evidences and knowledge, rather than from a point of instability, uncertainty, irresponsibility, and distortion and purposely suppression of information. So then, we can surely better conduct our expressions and behaviors towards the spiritual experiences we want to achieve. So, there's been very interesting recent developments concerning the revival of shamanic practices among heathens, or among people who feel a strong connection towards Nordic cultures and belief systems, mainly seeking to know shamanic practices of the Viking period in Scandinavia due to certain trends in pop culture, which is actually a period that doesn't give a lot of concrete clues concerning shamanic practices in Northern Europe in terms of practical behavior. Uh, but rather references in literary sources. And it's mostly those sources that provide some basis when searching for historical evidences of shamanism in Scandinavia. However, the revival of shamanic practices in Northern Europe, uh, much like the revival of shamanism in other European contexts, also gathers knowledge from altered states of consciousness, uh, trance, um, altered awareness and consciousness as a whole, as well as finding ways to communicate with deities and spirits. Perhaps in heathenry, and, and heathenry here very much involving the reconstructions of the religions of pre-Christian Iceland, Scandinavia and Anglo-Saxon Britain, perhaps in those contexts there's a bigger focus on trying to create a connection and an expression with and towards land spirits than in other any other uh, neo-pagan religious movements. Uh, the focus is much less on the gods and more towards an animistic desire to create symbiotic relationships with other than deities, entities of the world. Of course, uh, we face a problem here which is personal gnosis. Again, personal experiences aren't really the problem in themselves. What one person experiences will seldom be the same of what another experiences. Uh, it is seldom a collective experience, even though it is possible, but more often than not, it is quite the personal experience, an individual experience when it comes to these altered states of mind. It, it, it only becomes a problem when these experiences are passed on as the only truth or as historical evidences for past belief systems and then people try to invalidate both other people's experiences and the scientific research as well. This always complicates things and it creates a clash in reconstructionisms because some people are only focused on historical evidences and others only in their personal experiences. One does not invalidate the other, but we have to be careful in our claims because they might be quite damaging when it creates a hostile cancellation of both scientific work as well as personal experiences. 
we can combine both, <laughs> but there's a time and place for each. So this leads me to talk a little bit about New Age works that have greatly influenced the neo-shamanism movements of the 20th and now the 21st centuries. Uh, we are face to face with neo-shamanism and neo-shamans who have drawn a lot of knowledge, especially in practical behaviors and trance techniques from the works of Carlos Castaneda, Mercia Eliad, and Michael Harner. These are perhaps, and by far, the three figures who have greatly shaped neo-shamanism, and from their works there's been a reconstruction of shamanism that rarely follows the specific historical material culture, social and magical religious behaviors, as well as belief systems of cultural pockets and have instead created a global understanding of shamanism as if it were a religion. These three figures have had a great impact on the way the westernized world sees shamanism and therefore neo-shamans emerged and started conducting things through this new age lens. Now, to be perfectly honest with you, I do not have an extensive knowledge on the works of Carlos Castaneda, so I don't think I have a considerable baggage of knowledge to speak of him. Although I'm not completely ignorant concerning his works, <laughs> I am well aware of uh, the controversy. Uh, his forceful views on the subject of shamanism, the women of his group that have disappeared, uh, the adopted daughter uh, found dead, and the suicide panorama of the members of his group followed uh, or following his death. Uh, I have also read some of his works, obviously, as well, uh, uh, and it is noticeable the impact uh, it has had on, on many people, especially among artists in the 60s and 70s, right? However, I don't feel comfortable enough to speak about him as I didn't delve deeper into this rabbit hole. <laughs> but uh, uh, I'm certain many of you know his works and you know how much it has been an influence on neo-shamanism. However, I am quite familiar with the works of the other two, Mercia Eliad and Michael Harner. I have spoken uh, a little bit about Mercia Eliad already on the video I did about the role of the shaman and how a shaman is understood within an animistic perspective. You can see the video right here uh, by clicking on this information icon at the right, upper, your right upper corner. Right? Uh, but, but, but I think it's important to refer that Mercy Eliad's views on shamanism are his own beliefs of what he wanted shamanism to be. You can see this quite clearly, actually, in the sources he used as the sources Eliad presents as the cases of study of on shamanism he has manipulated those sources to fit into his own idea of shamanism and deliberately dismissed a lot of evidences that actually proves that his claims concerning shamanism are not what he was expressing. <laughs> so basically, Eliad's construction of an allegedly archaic cosmology, which is central to his work, um, it is in fact an imposition from the part of the author on the diversity of animism and shamanism evidenced in the very materials he manipulated. Shamanism, as presented by Eliad, is no more than an expression of, of what Eliad thought it should be, creating several wrong notions and misconceptions uh, concerning shamanism and giving the wrong impression of a religious character to it. His works are still useful in some aspects, obviously, but have to be taken with a grain of salt and the materials he used should be read apart from his work. So people may be aware of the manipulation and the deliberate distortion and, and rejection of important factors that show how diverse shamanism truly is. But this doesn't change the fact that Eliad's works were, and still are, one of the strong foundations of neo-shamanism for westernized societies, which shows that neo-shamanism hasn't really considered neither the diversity of shamanism nor the historical accuracy of animistic cultures and their expressions towards the spiritual through shamanism. The other author, as I've said, is Michael Arner, who was perhaps not as ambitious as Eliad in trying to demonstrate a personal belief and imposing it to the public, but he presents shamanism as a um, 
globalized spirituality in the sense that he actually also dismisses the, the wonderful diversity of the material culture, behaviors, belief systems, and the experiences of several indigenous cultures. I'm not saying that shamanism isn't a global phenomenon. It is a global phenomenon, indeed. What I'm saying is that Michael Harner painted a picture of shamanism as if it were something that develops from a premise, as if it were a homogeneous religious approach that everyone is capable of doing. And he creates this idea of an individualization of shamanism and the shaman as a religious figure, often dismissing animism and taking the figure of the shaman out of the animistic context and putting it in a westernized religious scenario, creating a priestly figure. So, what I'm saying here is that the shamanism of today in our Western culture is greatly based on Michael Harner's core shamanism. There's no doubt that he pioneered the introduction of shamanism or, or reintroduction of shamanism to contemporary life of Westernized societies. And there's something quite positive in this as it has woken up the interest in shamanism and people engaging in shamanism and trying to express themselves spiritually through this spectrum. Michael Harner made an excellent job in reintroducing shamanism to the Western society. However, he introduced to us core shamanism, which consists on the universal common features of shamanism, a movement not bound to any specific cultural group or perspective, which, in a way, it is great, but it also has a negative impact because it has dismissed the diversity of identities of peoples and cultures and the multiplicity of shamanic expressions. As such, instead of focusing on the reconstruction of cultural identities of shamanism, it cancels those identities, creating a homogeneous picture that doesn't include the diversity of identities and material culture. Core shamanism got us, Western people, into the habit of lying on the floor, listening to a recording of drumming, or in the best case scenario, listening to other people drumming for them, or for us, and uh, this whole idea revolving around the drum. So basically, core shamanism is a recreation of shamanic activities solely for Western people. In other words, we have adapted shamanism to our modern needs and daily lives within the Western society, which in a way it is good. But I've spoken about this before concerning Same neo shamanism as an example. And you can understand the negative impact of core shamanism when it comes to indigenous peoples, because the reconstruction of Same shamanism doesn't spring from the study of the Same material culture, identities, and belief systems, but rather from core shamanism. So basically, Same, neo-shamanism, is exactly that, a new age expression for the Sami, and they are not particularly focused on their identity, but rather on a westernization of shamanism. Of course, uh, things are changing, and lately, quite lately actually, uh, perhaps in the past 15 years or so, uh, there's been a lot of research concerning actual Sami shamanism, trying to reconstruct their belief systems and identities. But Same neo-shamanism is a good example of the invalidation of Same ethnic, cultural and religious identities provoked by core shamanism that has greatly influenced the Western mind towards shamanism and how we approach shamanism. Same shamanism is Nordic shamanism which has also greatly, greatly influenced Old Norse people in the past. And this also goes for the so-called heathen shamanism or uh, non finno ugric shamanism of Northern Europe. Michael Harner's core shamanism shaped an idea of Nordic shamanism and heathen shamanism as well by extent, especially in relation to this idea of using a drum. The great majority of the revival movements of Nordic shamanism nowadays include a drum and drum sessions or collective drumming. And there are no evidences whatsoever of the use of a drum in shamanism for pre-Christian Scandinavian Iron Age peoples. 
we see a lot of modern age Nordic witches, uh, reconstructions of the figure of the Volva, uh, Seidkona, uh, practitioner of Seidr, etc., dancing and using the drum in their performances these days. But there are actually no evidences of the use of the drum from the part of Viking age practitioners of Seidr, or among prophetesses, soothsayers, and itinerant, itinerant seers. On this video, I'm not going to develop on the lack of evidences concerning the drum in Viking Age shamanism. I have done a video about that, so if you have the time, obviously, I advise you to watch it. But this is another example of the damage of core shamanism on specific identities and material culture. Even though practitioners of Seder never used a drum, and there are no references for the use of a drum in the past, there were other objects, material culture, that it is important to be aware of, which is part of the identity of Nordic shamanism. The use of rattles, bells, singing, screaming, high-pitched vocals, galdr, a choir performing magic songs, the use of a bucket, which is almost always present in graves that show a type of material culture that matches with the historical evidences of the paraphernalia carried and used by a vulva a soothsayer by, by a series, right? So the use of the drum in Nordic reconstructions of shamanism of the Iron Age isn't actually accurate, and it's thanks to Michael Harner's core shamanism. And people are often dismissing a lot of important material culture that gives a unique identity to this spectrum of shamanism. And the di diversity of these materials found in archaeology and in literary sources being replaced by the drum actually have a meaning of their own, employed in different contexts with an identity of their own and specific purposes. And the knowledge of these materials and what they were used for and how is tremendously important if we are going to revive Nordic shamanism because it augments insight and expands people's expressions of a particular identity. To finalize this video and kind of actually get to an important source that gives us important clues that helps to revive Nordic shamanism, it's important to refer that there is a considerable body of literature or literary material that speaks about Nordic shamanism, at least referring to a content rarely straightforward and always shrouded in mystery that is in relation to shamanic or at least semi-shamanic performances and individuals. Uh, there are many Icelandic sagas that speak about uh, surviving pagan cults of a uh, shamanic nature, like in Njol's saga, as an example, which at some point in the saga refers to a man who is part of a lingering pagan cult in which another male figure presides as the performer of Seder. This saga, however, like many other sagas, have strong Christian religious derogatory views concerning the magical religious performances and the social behaviors and expressions of identity from the part of people who, one way or another, still demonstrate pagan pragmatic behaviors. So most sagas prevent us from truly understanding the performances, how everything was built, structured, the magical religious ethics, how rituals were conducted, their purposes, etc. Because a lot of information is purposely ignored, dismissed or overlooked, and always with a very slanderous and even sarcastic commentary. In the case of uh, Njol's saga, we get the intolerance in relation to man, the male figure who practices Seder, and the homophobic panorama in Northern Europe in later periods. But we also have myths and poetry, even though uh, it's also very shrouded in mystery for poetic purposes and to embellish the accounts, like the account of uh, Grogalder and Voluspa, which gives us indications of a certain shamanic behavior in relation to the Volur, the, the prophetesses of Scandinavian society. The Voluspa account itself, not only we understand the implications of a necromantic act, and the summoning of the spirit of the vulva, but the vulva herself speaks for herself and speaks as another. So we find a parallel with other cases of shamanism and the presence of helping spirits and the symbiotic relationship built between shaman and the tutelary spirit. We have several accounts that focus on the social interaction with 
uh, itinerant seers and soothsayers, uh, but never great details on their performances. So it's, it's really not that helpful to help us revive the actual shamanic practices. But at least we know that shamanism, or at least um, semi-shamanic performances, were still conducted in Northern Europe, uh, within Old Norse society, as far as the early Middle Ages for Scandinavia. For a long period, it was thought that terms such as setkona, volva, spokona, etc. were synonyms. But we have come to realize that both the pre-Christian Scandinavian mentality towards magic and the structure of magical performances were far more complex. So there were actually plenty of distinctions. A Seidkona was a woman practitioner of Seidr, but Seidr was more complex than originally thought. It wasn't just witchcraft or feminine sorcery, but also a semi-shamanic performance. And some men were also involved. And not every Seder performance and performer had the same level of power and even occupation within the Old Norse society. Some women practitioners of Seder only conducted divination within Old Norse society, accepted within the boundaries of the community, the, the physical community, according to what was acceptable within the social standards. Some women practitioners of Seder were not welcomed at all within the Old Norse society, within the community. Some of them were Old Norse women. Other, others were uh, itinerant seers from Sápmi and, and or from Finland. Some were simply labeled wise women, Vizintkunor, either alone or accompanied by a group of people, usually very specific numbers of maiden assistants. There were Galdrkönr, uh, women who performed Galdr. Uh, we have also come to realize that the term Eregi, Right? That was often used as a derogatory and homophobic term towards men who practiced seidr, or any other magical art, uh, isn't actually just a negative term, but um, in itself was a specific magical performance. There's also the term heider, which was thought to be the name of a goddess, more specifically the resurrection, or the sort of resurrected form of Gurveig, which, which it is. Right, But at the same time, it's more than that, and the entire account concerning Gulveig gives us an indication of the structure of Seidr and the cultic society of women and their approach to magic and the creation of specific restricted female societies for women, and also the transgender aspects of Seidr. The term Heider occurs in the sources as a type of category of sorceresses, Mostly, mostly related to the art of prophecy, U usually occurring in sagas that denote a, a connection between the term Heider and the far north, probably specifically referring to Sami women. So there's actually plenty of evidences of magic arts of at least Sami shamanic performances and their specific performers and assistants in Northern Europe. The problem is that these literary accounts do not offer a lot of details on the practices, arrangement, or rituals, material and techniques that helped induce altered states of consciousness. And we know that some of these performances do not even require altered states of consciousness. But it's hard to understand why and what are the differences that led people to perform things in this way or that way, and when was it necessary or not to sing or to evoke through poetry, and which circumstances required a lot more effort in the expressions to contact with the supernatural or, or the means to create communication with other than human beings. Surely, archaeology helps a lot uh, and reveals a wondrous variety of material culture that matches some of the literary sources and beyond that even, but objects do not speak. Even though many graves and the way they were arranged offer plenty of useful clues and a certain image, image um, can be created, but the mentality itself, the feelings, emotions, the identities, or rather the true human essence behind the desires, needs and actions isn't there. Archaeology reveals materials that are the manifestation of intention but do not fully, uh, there, there's, a, there's no, no full explanation for, that led the, to the creation of those materials that have once helped in magical religious performances and how they were used. 
Of course, comparison is possible with living shamanic traditions, but there are always essential details that are missing. Even so, there's a lot of material that helps revive some of these performances. And when we are face to face with missing pieces, we make do. Not only through New Age movements, such as the ones spoken before, but this is also when personal experiences enter the scene. We may be able to recover certain materials and to a certain extent understand parts of performances, but in order to advance and push forward in the attempt to create communication and relationship with other than human beings, it's important to add our personal expressions, how we identify ourselves. And with the material at hand, we revive or recreate a type of shamanic performance. So there it is. We should not be too quick to judge when people bring into the scene their own expressions in an attempt to recreate a spirituality, religion, or the employment of a shamanic performance and service towards a community. Because when we try to revive past magical religious behaviors, we will eventually be face to face with the real challenge of not having enough to move forward. So that's when our personal expressions of our own identities fill in the gaps. And as said before, I do not see a problem with it, because the human relation with the supernatural and with several beings that are neither animal nor human and the creation of relationships with such other-than-human and more-than-human entities or persons is something that has always been evolving throughout the entirety of human history. It's, it's important to be conscious that when we try to revive a certain cultural past, we will inevitably be in, in the challenging position of no longer having anything concrete to move forward. So we adapt, improve and evolve. However, <laughs> I almost forgot, uh, there's actually an interesting, one interesting account, uh, which is the, the only one that gives us quite a lot of details concerning a shamanic performance and uh, Volva herself, in this case the woman soothsayer, uh, which I think it should be definitely taken into consideration and a good starting point to build up a certain understanding of Nordic shamanism. I'm talking about, of course, Eriks Saga Roda. I'm not going to develop too much on this. I have already addressed this specific account in other videos, uh, one of which concerning the song Vardlokur as the singing ex expression to prepare the vulva for the shamanic performance. You can check that uh, if you have the time <laughs> at, at this information icon once again. Seriously, uh, check it out uh, and there will be videos there that may be of your interest concerning Nordic shamanism. <laughs> anyway, Eriks Sagaroda uh, may not give us details on the techniques and what words were spoken or sang and how they were sang, but it has a surprisingly considerable focus on the costume and the equipment of the practitioner of Seder and some hints at elements of the performance. There's this um, itinerant soothsayer named Thorbjörg, who is called into a farm of a prominent figure in that colony in Greenland. There's a general famine in Greenland, so they call this wandering prophetess to reveal the future because the, the situation is uncertain. We clearly understand that she doesn't belong to the colony and she wanders about performing rites of Seder. The, the prophetess is invited, she spends the night at the farm, uh, One, I think it's just one night at the farm, and a special meal is given to her at Torbjörg's request. They build her a high seat, a cedar platform, where she is to sit the next day to deliver her performance. We are told that she wears a blue cloak with a strap set with stones all over the skirts. She had glass beads on her neck, a black lambskin kerchief, on her head, she had a staff in her hand with a, a, a knob ornamented with brass and stones below the knob, a skin purse on her belt where she preserved her charms she needed to do her magic, etc, etc. It's really worth reading this specific account and from a, her paraphernalia and comparison with some Viking Age graves that present details in relation to practitioners of Seder and the material culture involved 
we can draw a lot of useful conclusions and hypotheses that really help in the revival of Nordic shamanism, to a certain extent, of course. At least we are not starting from scratch, and there's a lot of material from which we can develop this revivalism of Nordic shamanism. One of the most important details of her performance is precisely the song Vardlokur, uh, that she requires to be sung by a woman of the community who still knew the ancient songs. And this bears parallels with other accounts, both the assistants of the Vova, but also in the case of lonely, wandering prophetesses, they ask the women of the community to sing the songs for them, which apparently helped the Volvo creating a communication with the local spirits and possibly with her tutelary spirits. As this saga tells us that after the song, well, uh, the spirits have come to the Volvo, made their presence known and revealed to the Volvo. And so the Volvo proceeds into gathering knowledge from these spirits that were attracted by the song itself. More details on this on the, on the other video <laughs> I've pointed out earlier. But it is indeed a good source, and even though it is a later Old Norse source in a geographic context far from Scandinavia, it, it, it offers important details. Uh, the vulva in question may not even be European, actually. Uh, the way that this account develops actually points to a native indigenous person, most, most likely Inuit. Just the same way other accounts concerning prophetesses in Northern Europe speak of Same, soothsayers, and other Finno-Ugric seeresses. But there's plenty of important parallels here in these accounts that point to shamanic and semi-shamanic performances and material culture found in circumpolar contexts. So, this to say that the revival of Nordic shamanism doesn't come from nothing. And I think it is important, it is very useful to be aware or to know the study and study the surviving literary sources as well as the archaeological evidences, anthropological studies, folklore, traditional folk magic, etc. To give a strong foundation to this revivalism and never forgetting about the important cultural syncretism through time because these performances do not come from nothing and in their core there's plenty of different identities. And, of course, uh, with our own methods and how we choose to express ourselves towards this gathered information, we adapt, readjust, we evolve and improve. That's how everything works. I think it's important to have this in mind, that an obstacle is a challenge and not a defeat. We can always overcome it. All right, my dear friends, thank you so much for watching. I hope this video was useful. Uh, I know that uh, there's always a lot of people that are a little bit condescending towards others who are trying their best to revive these cultural contexts, usually from our part, Europeans. Sometimes we can really be very inconvenient and showing a feeling of patronizing superiority when it comes to the, the revival of European paganisms from the part of those who are not Europeans. Sometimes we Europeans forget about the privilege of still residing within these cultural contexts and how close we actually are to pre-Christian monuments and the archaeological contexts and the mythologies and folklore and even surviving traditional folk magical practices we have been born into. The easy access to the sources uh, linguistic uh, expressions and, and all of that. And I see a lot of Europeans being very snobbish to the point of ostracizing others. As a European myself, I apologize for the other in inconsiderate fuckers. Uh, don't let anyone look down on you and shove you off uh, as if you were dust. Don't let that discourage you. You do you and keep practicing and keep trying. Express yourself in the manner that is more comfortable to you, express your true identity and move forward. Never stop being a student and keep on educating yourself. Focus your mind on the importance of keeping on evolving and overcoming every challenge with the knowledge, practice and experience you, you have gathered thus far and keep on gathering. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching. See you on the next video. And as always, Tak Furida. 
Thanks for today. Obrigado por hoje. Farewell.